Hi, I'd just like to welcome everyone to this fourth solidarity session in our webinar series on Palestine. Tonight's session will be on international law and uh, our presenter is John Reynolds. As you can see there, we've we've had, uh, uh, this is the, the fourth session, so we've had three sessions. We've had an introductory session, a session on history, a session on life under apartheid. Uh, tonight we're focusing on international law and uh, we have one more session next week. So thank you for joining us. I think we have uh, almost, uh, we have about 75 people on the call already. And I guess uh, other people will be will be dropping in uh, shortly. So we're going to start. I'll just say a couple of intro introductory things. This is uh, a Zoom webinar. Uh, John is going to present for about 40 minutes. Uh, we'll have a 20 minute Q&A approximately after that. We will take your questions uh, either. Well, obviously, you've got it when you see your screen. If you look on your screen, you've got uh, the chat is disabled because we just couldn't uh, handle the, the volume of chat that, that that would be generated on such a call with quite a, with so many people. Uh, you So basically, the only uh, interaction you've got really is a and a button. So to ask questions, right? So we'll see the questions. Not everybody will see all the questions because we would just want to make keep the keep the presentation focused. And we will answer as many questions we can uh, as best we can uh, with the combination of John and ourselves here. Uh, so, uh, and that's the Q and A button there on the on the on the on the on the bottom. We won't be answering questions immediately. We will wait for John to finish, and then we will pose some of the questions directly to John, uh, and uh, some we will we will respond by text. Okay. So, if you have any other questions, then you can send them to education at ipsc.ie, and we will come back to you at, uh, after this uh, session. Okay. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. I'm going to pass over to John. So, John, you're very welcome. John is a a, a, a human rights rights lawyer, uh, an expert on Palestine, uh, associate professor professor uh, of law at Maynooth University. So, John, you're very welcome, and I'll hand, hand over to you. Thanks very much, Tom, and thank you for, to the IPC IPSC for for organising this and for, for inviting me. It's great to see. So many people here of a Monday evening, and I hope all the, the other sessions have been have been useful. So just I have shared my screen there and I'm assuming my microphone is working OK and everyone can hear me. But just uh, give me a nod or a shout if not. So I'm going to speak, you know, very generally and, and hopefully like it will be a little bit, I suppose, introductory and, and uh, potentially superficial for people that have studied or are, are kind of familiar with, with the detail and the um, um the ins and outs of, of some of the the international law background context arguments debates institutions rules practices and so on to do with with palestine so i'll try and just give a, a little bit of a whistle stop tour i know you've had a session on the history of the uh situation in, in palestine so i won't duplicate that but i will just use a little bit of a chronology to tell the story of international law as it relates to Palestine over the last hundred years or so really but but primarily focusing on on what's going on today and 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 the recent months and, and years uh, but just to put it in a little bit of context I'll, I'll start from from 1922 and the League of Nations mandate but before I do that I'll just just to say a couple of words just to, in in kind of quite general terms about to, to try and situate things um and and because Tom was just asking me this beforehand and it is something I do say generally at at you know when i'm when i'm speaking about these kind of things so i study international law i research international law i teach international law i am a, an international lawyer i don't practice as a lawyer but i do i am involved in supporting cases and litigation and legal actions that are going on in different contexts um but it is important to say you know that i don't have any huge kind of uh, illusions about the capacity of international law to you know to provide emancipation or liberation or equality really it by itself in any context and certainly not in the in in, in a context as, as challenging and difficult as that uh which we have in in palestine and so there is you know and there, there's a couple of i suppose broad kind of elements to some of the discourse that comes up, up around this one is this idea that because there is a general sense that a lot of the rules and norms of international law when it comes to Palestine are on the side of the Palestinians, which is to a large extent true. If we think about, you know, some of the most basic elements of the colonization of, of Palestine, the settlements 
that Israel has been building in the West Bank, for example, since 1967, are very clearly and definitively illegal. Israel, the Israeli government lawyers or the Israeli state will try to come up with sort of convoluted arguments to say, actually, no, they're not illegal. But, you know, there, there's, you know, it's it's an issue that there's as almost as much clarity and consensus as you'll get across the board in international law as is possible to, to say that the settlements are illegal, right? But the, the fact is the settlements are still there and they're still being expanded and there's more and more being built every day, right? So there's this, so one, one part of it is about enforcement, right? The rules are clear or so it seems. And so there's an issue with enforcement. So that's one point, I suppose, just to put on the table that we'll come back to. The second part then is, is around an idea of kind of double standards or hypocrisy, that the rules are enforced by the big powers in international law and international relations when it suits them. And when it's when it when the rules are going against the, them or their allies, those rules won't be enforced. And so there's a, a kind of a hypocrisy or a double standard at play. And again, obviously, you know, there's a large element of Truth to that, one of the most glaring, obviously, comparisons we've had in the last couple of years being the difference between the response and the um, um, international reaction to, or certainly the reaction of the, the Western powers and the main, inter, the main um, uh, permanent members of the Security Council, the, the difference in the reaction between the invasion of Ukraine and the assault on Gaza over the last nine months, right? And again, you know, there is, there's, obviously something to that or has been you know if we think about the european union's response or the united states response there's, there's been a you know a, a striking difference in and how they have interpreted and um uh, responded when it comes to specifically the international law questions leaving aside all of the other political and economic factors um so so that's the second point but then the third point which is i think important to note and which will which i will get into once i start the, the, the kind of little historical overview, the, the reality is also as much as it's true that a lot of the rules today appear to be on the side of the Palestinians in how we understand the situation of, uh, you know, of uh, particularly in, in the West Bank and Gaza, um, there is also an underlying kind of history of international law, which is very closely aligned with and tied to colonial power, colonial, colonial expansion and colonial interests in the world and a lot of the formative kind of period of international law as it evolved from the early treaties that were um, made between Spain and Portugal for example to divide up South America between them uh, all the way through to the Berlin conference in the 1880s and the, div the division of, of um, the African continent along lines that were drawn by European politicians on a map there's you know the theories of sovereignty the treaties that were um, enacted over the course of four centuries, all very much designed, you know, a whole system of, of law and legal theory and jurisprudence designed essentially to support the idea that the European states were superior, the European civilizations were superior, and they were entitled uh, not just by virtue of theology or by virtue of uh, some political theories or philosophies, but also by, as a, as a question of law, they were entitled to... Um, um, claim sovereignty to dispossess native peoples around the world and to rule the world in their own in their own image that you know four or five hundred years of international law making has started to be undone since only since 1960 really 1960 is a key year because that was the year that the global south bloc for the first time became the majority in the united nations and at the general assembly and started to pass resolutions declaring colonialism to be illegal and contrary to uh, international law and from there then we had a, a set of resolutions norms and bodies of law that uh, was prohibiting things like colonialism uh, apartheid and um, slavery and so on but up until that point you know a lot of those historical injustices had not just been not stopped by international law but actively facilitated and enabled by international law and so that's you know we're talking about 60 odd years of undoing four or 500 years of a system that had been put in place by the the European powers and subsequently the, the kind of settler colony states like the like the United States and Canada so if we go so so there is you know a, um, a question then about you know how definitive or how absolutely is it the case that international law is automatically and necessarily on the side of the Palestinians in in each um 
situation that we look at and we, and and where we get you know where it get where it does become a little bit more complicated or we have to think a little bit more critically about you know what these rules are doing are they being enforced and if they're not being enforced why not is it just simply a case of um of double standards or is there something structural and something deeper going on and so if we think about if we think about the assault and onslaught on on Gaza over the last nine months um the, the debates around you know the killing of civilians collateral damage the use of um artificial intelligence and algorithms to decide targets things that very uh, seem very basically and very obviously to be war crimes when we look at the amount you know the the, the civilian death toll the amount of women and children uh killed the amount of men killed that had you know that there was no evidence were were connected to participating in hostilities it seems very clear that you know hu uh, hugely disproportionate force has been used um, massive amounts of war crimes have been committed, but the you know the Israeli government lawyers will have these very um, um, detailed arguments to to um, contradict that and to say that's why why that is not the case. That's what they're trying to do at the International Court of Justice in the case against South Africa, and that's what what the, if it does come to prosecutions of Israeli leaders at the International Criminal Court, for example, they will try to use some of these. Um, uh, doctrines of international humanitarian law that do have this quite eurocentric and colonial origin going back to wars between european armies in the in the 1700s and 1800s and try to use them to say why what israel is doing is a war is not a war crime whereas what uh, hamas and the palestinian armed groups are doing is is war crimes and so there is, there is you know contestations over this so that's just to, to try and set it up in a little bit of context without getting too deep into it but i am happy to come back i will be touching on that as as i go along so it's just to, to set that out and happy to come back to that in the um in the discussions if there is any kind of urgent um clarifications needed on anything that that i'm saying that's not making sense or that i'm assuming knowledge or using language or jargon that's that's not familiar I do put it into the q a and, and tom might be able to give me a, a shout just to ask me to clarify but if we start the story and i mean there's various places we could start the story but if we start the story of international law in palestine in 1922 i'm sure in the history session you've heard you would have heard about the balfour declaration and uh, and the league of nations mandate which essentially did the league of nations mandate for palestine essentially reproduced the idea and and even the language verbatim from the the balfour declaration which talked about the the establishing a uh, a national home for the jewish people in uh, historic Palestine and then which talked about you know apart from the the Palestine as, as a as a national home for the Jewish people it talked about other existing non-Jewish communities right and so we see already in the language that the, the, the Palestinians or the Arab community in Palestine was not even being named as such in these documents it, they were they were kind of the other non non uh, be, being kind of demoted to the other community as though they were a, a lesser or ir irrelevant minority when actually they were the majority population as we know and their right to self-determination in their own territory was um was sidelined and was uh qualified very much by the, the this idea of of establishing a, a jewish um state or a Jewish homeland in historic Palestine. The League of Nations mandates in and of themselves already were, you know, if we think about that history of, you know, international law as part of the civilizing mission or the colonial project, the League of Nations mandates, which were covering territories um, on uh, that, that had been allocated or divided up uh, after the end of the First World War, um, based on the former Ottoman territories, the former Austrian, Hungarian, and and uh, German Empire territories being reorganized and reassigned to um, other governments, basically to hold them in trust for the native population, based on this assumption that the native populations in some of m many of the African and Middle Eastern uh, territories weren't yet ready. To, to govern themselves weren't sufficiently civilized. And so it's a lot of this um, language about civilization, about not being ready for self-government or self-rule. And so the territories needed to be held in trust by the um, the League of Nations, uh, but by the League of Nations um, uh, powers, which which included Britain and France, primarily when we talk about the, the Middle East region. And as you probably no, the you know the territories were divided up on the basis of of British and French colonial interests, 
Palestine was placed under the British mandate. But with this, you know, with this um, quite particular, it was it, it's kind of referred to as, a, as a, a special case or a sui generis mandate in that it wasn't just a, a, a British mandate to, to administer the Palestinian territory until the Palestinians were ready to govern and, and establish their own state. It was with this um, qualification about the, the rights of the Jewish people to, to have their homeland there. And so international law in, in its in itself is kind of implicated in the first place in you know the the um erasure or the, the demotion of the palestinian right to self-determination from this period post-world war one and also then subsequently in in the, the idea of partitioning palestine into separate states uh there was various developments over the course of the 1920s and 30s with um um the british um administration of palestine with uh pl various plans that were that were presented to and by the british government about how to how to how how a post british palestinian um political entity would look like how it would be governed what would be the role for the jewish community what would be the role for the the palestinians and so it, all of that culminated as uh, we know in the partition plan in 1947 so after the end of the first, second world war the British essentially pa abdicated their responsibility, passed passed things on to the to the UN once it had been established in nineteen forty five, and the, the partition plan was then uh, adopted by the UN General Assembly in nineteen forty seven with this idea of of creating two separate states in the one territory. The map there showing the you know the um the what what was assigned for the Jewish state having slightly more than. 50%, about 55% of the territory, even though the Jewish population was much less than half of the of the population at the time. And so for that reason, and because of um, a sense that this was a form of dispossession of the of the Arab Palestinian communities, a, a lot of the um, countries in the region uh, voted, including Greece and Turkey, uh, but also many of the Arab countries and some of the Asian countries that had already become independent or were members of the UN at that time, they voted against this resolution, but the majority voted in favor of it, about two thirds, which was made, mostly made up of the European states, uh, the US and the Soviet Union, and some of some um, Latin American states, a lot of the Latin American states also abstained. But we had this uh, resolution adopted. That was the first kind of major international legal decision, uh, let's say, on how on the, the, the future of Palestine. Palestine was really the first item on the UN's agenda from 1945-46 when it was set up there was a special and a UN special envoy appointed there was a special commission on Palestine and all of these institutions put in place very much from the start of the UN's existence and and it remains I, I had the, the slide at the start I had called the uh, presentation the, the, United, the sorry international law and the question of Palestine that's because that was what the UN called it from the start in 1945 this and this idea that it was a question that needed to be answered, which is, you know, in some ways, a uh, you know, problematic framing for thinking about it. But that was the that that was the what the agenda item as it was described at the time in the UN, and that continues to be. You'll still see UN General Assembly sessions going on on the question of Palestine, and so it was the first issue on the agenda in 1945, and it remains obviously one of the main uh, issues that the UN is involved in trying to in trying to resolve the partition plan obviously didn't resolve things it was never implemented in the form that it was um in the form that it was uh, envisaged in the un plan partly because the um as i said the, the arab countries didn't accept it and then the the war the is it, what what israel calls its war of independence what became the palestinian nakba or the catastrophe um unfolded in the two years that followed between 1947 48 49 in the war in, in 1948, obviously, as you know, uh, three quarters of the Palestinian population were displaced or ethnically cleansed from their homes and from their homeland. The The UN did pass Resolution 194 at the end of 1948, which is the resolution providing the legal right to return for the Palestinian refugees, which still stands and which is still an important part of the Palestinian um, rights sector and, and a major um a major part of the um advocacy and and um, 
agenda for 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 Palestinian advocates in the international legal system. So that that was UN Resolution One Nine Four. The Partition Plan, as I said, was was Resolution One Eight One. And so what happens then in in nineteen forty nine when Israel does become admitted as a member of the United Nations, its independence had been declared in in nineteen forty eight and recognized by many um, states at that point, and it was then admitted as a member of the UN and legitimized and normalized in that sense by the UN in 1949. But there was this condition that that membership of the of the UN was conditional on the implementation of UN resolutions 181 and 194. So the partition plan at, and, and uh, a Palestinian state on 45% of the territory, and then the right of all Palestinian refugees to return, right? As we know, those two resolutions have never been implemented. And so there is a question mark and it has been raised, you know, it's been raised repeatedly over the decades. Since then, it's been raised, um, particularly by some of the UN special rapporteurs recently again, this question of, you know, um, should should Israel's um, at least it's 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 full position in the UN General Assembly be reevaluated when apartheid when when there was a um, realization in the 1970s after two decades of, of apartheid and willful kind of disregard by the apartheid regime in South Africa for all of the UN's attempts to um to address it and to resolve the situation there, the UN General Assembly voted to to what they called unseat uh, South Africa from the General Assembly, right? Which is not, um, which is not expelling uh, South Africa from the from the UN altogether, but is um saying that it can't take its seat at the UN General Assembly uh, sessions. It re- loses its its right to participate and to to speak and to vote in the in the general assembly and that was that remained in place from 1974 until the end of apartheid in the early 1990s and so there have been calls uh, for you know a similar um process to be to be looked at when it when it comes to to Israel today and there was so I suppose it's just to to acknowledge that that was um, um a, a condition that that was there from the from the start right so at uh, the the, there are question marks over, you know, f- f- you know, from the very start of Israel's membership of the UN over its willingness to comply with the the rules and regulations that it was subject to. Nineteen sixty seven, obviously, we had the the Six Day War, the the uh, Israeli occupation of um, Palestinian territories, but also the Egyptian Sinai and and Syrian territory as well. And there was this famous Security Council resolution passed in the aftermath of that, calling on Israel to withdraw from the territories it occupied during the 1967 war. Subsequently, as part of the, the peace um, negotiations with Egypt, it did withdraw from, from the Sinai, but it continues to occupy Syrian as well as, as obviously Palestinian territory. And that occupation now is 50, what are we, 57 years Um that it's been continuing for the, the whole idea of an occupation as some of you may know under international law and what what is allowed as a as a, a post-war occupation situation the whole idea of it is premised on the occupation being temporary being a, 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 a for, for purely short-term purposes of stabilizing the situation at the end of a war and about then restoring stability and uh handing back sovereignty and governance um rights to the to the local population once they're once they're you know able to do so again and so you know if we think of classic examples like the the allied occupation of of um, parts of germany at the end of the second world war you know the idea of of that was obviously just about restoring um uh, uh, peace and stability post-war and uh allowing time for for the german state and institutions to reconstitute themselves to um, uh, re-establish a new form of governance post-Nazism and so on, to be able to then uh, get back to its own its own sovereign uh, being, and so that, that that that's the general idea. But obviously, here we have what we have is essentially the Israeli state using this idea of of occupation as a temporary situation to, in in a way that has has essentially become de facto permanent, and it allows Israel to a certain extent to pick and choose. Um, it's how it interacts with international law, right? So it's to say that well, this is a you know a temporary situation, and we as the occupying power have certain rights and certain responsibilities to maintain law and order in the occupied territories. That gives us the the rights to detain people, to arrest people, to impose curfews, and so on 
if necessary to maintain stability <clears throat> and order and they use a lot of the British colonial emergency regulations as the basis for doing so in the in the occupied territories and, and particularly in the West Bank uh, still to this day and so you, you'll know about all of the you know huge numbers of uh, thousands of Palestinians who are detained without trial, right, interned or put in administrative detention. That is technically permissible under the um, British era, colonial era uh, emergency regulations that were in place in, in Palestine under the, Brit under the British mandate of the League of Nations period that Israel has carried over into its occupation in um in the occupied territories and says is is justified under the laws of, of occupation. But obviously, you know, those laws of occupation, the, the idea of occupation was never meant to continue for, for 57 years. And the, the assumption was that it would it would transition away from that. And so if that's part of that's there, there's we'll talk about the, the South Africa case against Israel at the International Court of Justice uh, uh, to do with the Genocide Convention. But the other a process that's been going on at the International Court of Justice in the last couple of years has been about this very question of the prolonged nature of the Israeli occupation and to say that essentially, you know, even though there, there's no specific time limit laid down by the Geneva Conventions or the rules of international humanitarian law to say an occupation can only last at most five years or three years or seven years after the end of a war, there's no specific time limit put down. And so Israel's kind of use that to its, its advantage to continue it indefinitely but the argument that's been put forward at the international court of justice is that you know it's it, whatever about you know in the initial period it's the, the occupation is of such a prolonged nature now is so systemic is so entrenched and has taken on these characteristics of systemic violations of humanitarian law as well as features of apartheid and colonialism and systemic racial discrimination and so on continued colonization that it's essentially of an annexation of Palestinian territory, an annexation and acquisition of territory by force is very much illegal under international law. Uh, that's what's happening in reality, uh, whereas what's happening uh, in theory on the on the kind of legal papers is that it's a, a continuing indefinite occupation. And so the um, um, General Assembly has referred that question to the International Court of Justice and what the, um, what the um, lawyers arguing for um Palestine and for many other cases for many other countries that have participated in this uh process are saying is that you know it, it it's it, the, the culmination and the combination of factors means that the occupation in and of itself not just individual practices of torture or war crimes or destruction of property but the, the entire system of occupation is illegal by itself in and of itself and should be immediately dismantled right there is as i said the resolution 242 from 1967 calling on israel to withdraw from the from the territories that's a, a principle of, of international law itself that they should have withdrawn when they were asked to do so at the time but obviously they haven't done so and are making these legal arguments as to why they uh, can't do so justified by the security um concerns and so on and that um but but you know the Clearly, the continued kind of colonization, construction of settlements um, gives the gives the lie to that. And so the, the advisory opinion from the International Court of Justice on that question about the illegal occupation is due to be um, is due to be handed out down, I think, in July. So next next month. So you can keep an eye out for that. There, they, some of you may have seen the hearings being um a broadcast or some of the clips of them back in in February, where many different states, including Ireland and the Irish Attorney General, speaking on behalf of Ireland, participated, presented their arguments to the court in that case. Now that's that's a, a, it's the same court as the South Africa versus Israel genocide case, but it's a, a different pro, a different case altogether. So there'll be a sep there'll be its own um uh, judgment in in that due in in um in July. Okay, I can, I'm happy to come back to that uh, later, but that's on the, the question of the ongoing legality of the occupation. Um, I'll s Let me just skip on. So I'm, I'm kind of, this is obviously, like I said, a bit of a whistle-stop tour. There was many developments going on through the 1970s, many UN resolutions that were linking the question of Palestine with the, the question of apartheid in South Africa, talking about um, uh, systemic racist regimes like that of apartheid in Southern Africa, 
as well as uh, regimes of ongoing occupation and colonization like those in in Palestine and elsewhere being um being contrary to the UN charter and the spirit of the United Nations and should be you know calling on UN member states to intervene and to ensure that those occupations and racist regimes were dismantled uh, if if you look at the UN debates and records from the 1970s you'll see a lot of a lot of the time the Palestinian question being linked with with apartheid in southern africa just to to mention um the, the massacres in sabra and shatila and sort of in, in lebanon in, in 1982 where um for the first time there was at that point a general assembly resolution talking about the the mass killing of palestinian civilians by um forces in lebanon supported by israeli forces at that time as a as an act of genocide right and so we, we talk we've heard a lot about genocide in the last nine months and the arguments there but did, there was did, uh, a finding from a from a un commission of inquiry and a, a resolution from the un general assembly in 1982 talking about uh, an act of genocide against palestinians at that point um the question obviously of of the of of this of the of statehood and sovereignty in, in Palestine has, has always been on the agenda as part of the broader legal questions about how to um, resolve the, the situation in Palestine, how to be best protect Palestinian rights. The position, um, as you probably know, of the, of the PLO and the Palestinian movement post-1948 and post-1967 was uh, articulated as a as a what we what we'd call now a one state solution and the idea of a, of a single democratic state as the way for Palestinians to exercise their self determination sovereignty in all of historic Palestine that shifted in in the nineteen eighties with the declaration of Palestinian independence in Algiers by the PLO in nineteen eighty eight where the PLO essentially recognized um, Israel at that point and said that the the Palestinian state would uh, be would, would exist um in in the west bank and gaza as its own separate independent state at that point um probably the majority of un members in in 1988 89 thereabouts did recognize palestine most of them being the the global south um bloc and members in the in the un the the western countries didn't at that point but this was in the period of the the first intifada which did lead on to the uh to the Oslo Accords and uh a set of developments in the 1990s which I haven't uh included as my uh, on my slides there and that's because really you know a lot of the um analysis you'll read by Palestinian lawyers and by the um uh, even some of the Palestinian legal advisors who had been involved in advising the PLO who were part of the PLO delegation to the Madrid talks and the Oslo talks people like Raja Shahada, who was who some of you may know, was one of the founders of, of Al Haq, the main Palestinian human rights organization. They were there, they were advising on the legal questions, but they ultimately um left or didn't fully participate because of their dismay at how the, the PLO, as they saw it, were um sidelining international law, were dealing, were dealing with uh, with the negotiations in, on, on a kind of a trade-off and compromise basis and looking after to a certain extent their own. Uh, self-interest and and the Oslo Accords if we look you know a lot of the, the critiques of the Oslo Accords were that they were there was no kind of principles of international law embedded into them and so that was part of the reason that they failed because obviously as we know Oslo was signed in, in 1993 as of this interim accord with a view to a final status uh, agreement but all of the settlement construction that was going on for example in the West Bank pre-Oslo was only um, escalated and expanded and the number of settlements doubled and tripled over the course of the 1990s and early 2000s and so there was a you know again an abandonment of, of international law in that in that uh, process and in that period and one of the things that Israel started to do at that point that that obviously was part of the context of the second the second intifada um um starting in in in, two, in the early 2000s and the um frustration that Palestinians had at that point with the with, with what they saw as the lack of you know the, the peace process really as this as a as a process but but uh, as not anything that was was bringing um peace let alone let alone justice and so we had the intifada starting the construction of the wall by Israel through the West Bank, uh, ostensibly again for security reasons, but 
you know the the analysis that was if you know that was done on the on the root of the wall, the way it was built to envelop a lot of the big settlement uh, areas in on the Israeli side of the Green Line and to essentially operate as a form again of annexation or of of uh, consolidation of the colonial context. The the wall was was do was was designed essentially to um to make the settlement um the, the major settlement uh centers the major sites where where Israeli civilians had been transferred into Palestinian territory where Palestinians had been cleared off their land to to make to to turn those into permanent um cities and permanent settlements and to consolidate a lot of the infrastructure, the roads, the um exploited resources, the land uh, that had been that had been extracted and expropriated to keep all of that on the Israeli side of the of the wall. That was challenged at that time in the in the International Court of Justice and there was a decision and an advisory opinion from the International Court at that time in 2004 to say that the wall was illegal as well as the all of the settlement um and related infrastructure that it was designed to uh, to annex all of the settlements themselves were illegal. This was confirmed by the the International Court of Justice. The um uh, and and it talked about the wall being tantamount to annexation of of Palestinian territory, about it being a form of acquisition of territory by force, which was illegal. And it said that the you know the wall should be dismantled. The um. Israeli occupation should um, be withdrawn from the occupied territories. Israel was obliged to pay reparations to Palestinians for all of the expropriation and harm done, and that also that the UN and all of its member states should take action to um, to to ensure that that the, that the, the ruling was followed. Again, as we know that that you know that decision and opinion, as strong as it is, what hasn't been respected by Israel hasn't really been. Uh, uh, enforced in any meaningful way by the UN or by its member states, and so that was part of the context for civil Palestinian civil society, for example, taking things, taking up the initiative in, that it did in two thousand and five to issue the the BDS call, which was based on the I see the International Court of Justice decision on the wall and the lack of compliance with it, and so we see there, you know, important part of the intersection and interaction between international law and its decisions and its institutions at the higher level and social movements and civil society organizations at the more grassroots level. Um, so that was 2004. I'm um, just conscious of the time. I, I apologize if I'm, if I'm, if I do, I'm skipping on a little bit um, quickly, but again, you know, there were continuing developments through all of this period, but another couple just to highlight before we get to the current situation in Gaza 2012 um as you may remember the the Palestinian authority went to the UN seeking recognition of the Palestinian state uh, it obviously like i said post 1988 had got recognition from a lot from the majority from more than a uh, 100 countries at that point but it was now looking for this to be formalized through the UN system partly again you know from a if we think about it from a critical or cynical perspective partly as part of the PAs project of legitimizing itself uh, you know in, in terms of its own internal legitimacy and and um contestations with with other rival um parties and factions inside palestine but also to to allow palestine to sign up to international agreements and treaties and uh, join international courts and so on that this was part of the strategy at this point the um uh, realization was that the peace process had failed and so uh, the, the Palestinian Authority wanted to to try and use if, if diplomatic avenues were exhausted and and weren't succeeding wanted to try and use legal avenues and um, uh, legal institutions through the UN system and so to join a lot of those uh, treaties and institutions it had to have status as a state right because the international legal system is designed primarily uh, by but also for states and you have to be a state a recognized state to be a member of the un for example to join up to the international criminal court or uh, to sign international human rights treaties and so on so they went to the un they got a resolution from the un general assembly with 138 out of the 193 countries uh voting to recognize palestine as an independent existing independent state to give it this status as a uh, observer state at the un and then to refer to on to the, to the un security council which is the body that decides on membership itself the us veto at the un security council was always going to block 
Palestine becoming a member of the UN uh, itself. You see in the image there at the bottom, the blue chair with the, the Palestinian seat. Uh, they Palestinians were arguing they wanted to be a member, to be a, a, a seat at the table of the UN. They, were, they, they weren't admitted as a full member because of the US um, veto at the Security Council, but they did have this new kind of um, elevated status of being recognized as a state, an existing and independent state, not just by all of these individual different countries in their bilateral relations, but also by the UN General Assembly as a body. And so that allowed Palestine, for example, to join the International Criminal Court, allowed it to sign up to the Geneva Conventions or the International Convention on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination and have access to the institutions then uh, to take cases against Israel, to initiate um, uh, legal actions against Israel through the, through the UN system, right? Um, so um, that was 2012. And, you know, we can debate the merits or the, you know, the um, flaws of, you know, of, of uh, buying into this idea that there is a Palestinian state functioning in the West Bank and Gaza, you know, in reality, it, uh, it's 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 not a functional state as such. But there is, you know, some of the, enough of the legal boxes ha, were were determined to have been ticked to grant Palestine this this recognition and allow them allow them access to the to the international law system, right? So that, like I said, did allow for Palestine to join the the International Criminal Court and and have access to other institutions. I just mentioned a couple of developments in in 2021. Um, the, the Palestine first tried to join the International Court or to to refer jurisdiction to the International Criminal Court in 2009 after Operation Cast Lead, and at that point, the prosecutor said, "I'm not sure whether Palestine is a state or not, so I can't go forward with this." The, the, I, I as an international a criminal prosecutor. I'm not the person to decide on a question of statehood. That's for the the UN political organs and the General Assembly to decide. So once the General Assembly did decide in 2012 to that Palestine was a state, then it was able to go back to the International Criminal Court, join as a full member, which it did in in 2014 15, and refer then the situation in in uh, the West Bank and Gaza to the ICC. The ICC was reluctant, quite reluctant, for many years to get involved with the situation in Palestine already was struggling with its own with you know it's it uh, getting progress in its cases elsewhere there was a lot of accusations of the ICC being essentially a a western court to prosecute soft targets in in african conflict sites and not being willing to to go after american war crimes in in afghanistan or british war crimes in in iraq and so on and there's still ongoing tensions and and uh, contestations over that at the ICC, and obviously the Palestine situation was um, a very contentious one. When um, when the uh, in in twenty twenty one, or sorry, in twenty nineteen, it was that the the prosecutor at, of the ICC at that point said they were going to um, go ahead uh, with a uh, what they call a preliminary examination of the case, and then in twenty twenty one said that there was sufficient evidence to investigate potential war crimes and crimes against humanity in Palestine, and they were opening a full investigation with a view to um to initiating prosecutions, right? And that oh, at various points over the course of this process, the U.S. particularly, but also um important uh, members of the international criminal court like Germany have been very actively adv lobbying and advocating against. ICC um, intervention in in Palestine under Trump, the um, the US put even put sanctions in place against the ICC prosecutor and her um, family and associates at the time. There's talk now with the most recent developments that you know that that the US could do that again. Um, I'll come I'll come on to that on on, on the next slide, but just to also mention that 2021, the human rights the UN Human Rights Council also set up this. Um, commission of inquiry on the occupied Palestinian territory, and this was an, a, an important or uh, significant development. In that, up to this point, there had been many fact finding missions uh, or commissions of inquiry set up by the UN after a particular um, escalation, primarily in in Gaza, but even if we think back to to Lebanon in 1982. So, uh, in, in in after Operation Cast Lead in, in 2009, Operation Protective Edge in 2014, and so on. Anytime there was a major escalation of the situation, particularly in Gaza, the UN would appoint a fact finding commission to go and um, analyze the situation, review the evidence, and make 
findings which can be part of the evidence base then for, for example, an international criminal court prosecution or investigation, as well as the basis for states and members of the UN to respond to the situation. And the, these fact-finding missions or commissions inquiry do these very detailed um, analysis of the, of the facts of what happened over the course of an operation or a, an escalation of the conflict, and then a legal analysis of what potential crimes may have been committed and who would be responsible for them and so that but they're always on an ad hoc basis always quite reactive established after the latest round of escalation of hostilities and then presented as findings to the to the human rights council and the idea would be that they would make their way up the chain in the un system from human rights council to general assembly to security council but obviously at a certain point there would be a blockage and they wouldn't go any further the one that was set up in, in 2021 is is not an ad hoc one as, and a reaction to a specific one-off set of events it's a, a more ongoing longer term mandate and it's not just about a reactive what you know what's happened in the most recent escalation it's also about trying to it, it has a mandate to explore what are what the un called the root causes of the uh, situation in in palestine the root causes of the um violation of, of palestinian rights as as they're ongoing and so it has a, a wider and also longer mandate. And that was the, uh, it's issued a few reports so far, including most recently last uh, last week on some of the um, events on October 7th and in Gaza post October 7th. So some of you may have seen some of the reporting on that, but that's a, a commission made up of three um, independent experts, legal experts, and, 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 and a team of investigators working with them. And so they have that ongoing mandate like I said, and and potentially allows for a, a longer uh, view of the of the situation from an international law perspective, right? So that and and that that like I said is you know they're looking at some of the similar questions that the international criminal court is looking at, and as you'll have uh, probably seen last month, after much delay and inaction and and huge amounts of criticism from the Palestinian uh, lawyers and legal organizations for for lack of action. Over the last nine months, the ICC prosecutor did finally uh, submit a request to the ICC for arrest warrants to be issued for the Israeli Prime Minister and the Israeli Defence Minister, as well as for three of the um, the Hamas political and military leaders as well. And so the um, question now, so I'm happy to again to speak to this more um, in the discussion, but the question now is, first of all, will the arrest warrants be confirmed and issued? By the by the court and then what you know what, what capacity the court will have to actually go ahead with uh with a prosecution on the basis of the evidence that it has put together so far so i'm happy to to speak to that more uh, as well afterwards the final point then and i've you know i've done a um uh other lectures for this on some of the other um for, for some of the uh, various kind of um solidarity groups in in uh, Ireland over the last number of months and it, and I have a, a fuller set of slides on the the South Africa Israel case and all of its implications which I'm happy to share if people are are interested in in uh, going through them but just to um in in very brief terms before I finish up just to highlight I suppose a couple of things one about just the significance of this case itself beyond the the legal questions you know and and of um Put, put a few of them on the on the slide there but it is you know a really uh, in many ways historic moment if we think about you know that colonial history of international law the way international law was really uh controlled and there was a process of kind of gatekeeping where the big powers would have the, a lot of the say over how international law was put to use how it was enforced what you know who had permission to speak in which institutions and so on this is a, you know a quite profound uh challenge to that and um um a, a kind of an upending of the you know historic balance of forces by uh South Africa as a global south uh country as a post colonial and post apartheid country itself speaking um with the Palestinians in this case using a lot of the the Palestinian kind of analysis uh, in the in the way it presented the case putting it into its historical putting the the, the, the violence in in um Gaza in the last nine last number of months as it was when the case was filed into its into its um historical context and really you know putting putting it up to international law and the institutions themselves to you know to to, to prove 
that they're not um undermined by double standards and, and hypocrisy and that and that they do have a meaning and will be you know are when they talk when we talk about you international law being universal that that is genuine and has a and has a meaning and so the you know the case was significant you know regardless of what happens ultimately in the final judgment which may be in you know not for another 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 number of years but the case was and is significant for challenging those those kind of historical balance of of forces and challenging the, the gatekeeping gatekeeping particularly around the question of genocide what the definition of genocide is how it can be enforced and you know the um and, and again i can uh, speak to this more if people want to get into it but the genocide convention itself having quite a, a narrow and eurocentric kind of history of its own that's being kind of put to the test now and, and challenged by the south africa case itself um so there is um a whole set of kind of developments we've had in the five months since the case has been filed i won't go through all these bullet points but just as you may know there, there have been south africa has gone back to the court a number of times asking for what it calls provisional measures and so this is kind of the equivalent in the international court of justice of of an emergency injunction type of process essentially where South Africa essentially in this case is accusing Israel of perpetrating genocide in Gaza but the the way international court case international court of justice cases go they tend to take a number of years sometimes many years before we have a final judgment on the overall uh, decision on the case and so where there's a an on a, a real and kind of immediate and urgent risk of of irreparable harm being done in the meantime while we're waiting for the all of the evidence to be reviewed and the judges to do their deliberations and all of the process that could of motions and appeals and counter motions that could take years. There is this process where the uh, complainant can ask for urgent provisional measures to be uh, ordered by the court. So not to prejudice the final decision in the case and, and not just to preempt it, but to say there's certain minimum things that need to be done and need to be complied with to, um, to ensure that there's not irreversible harm done in here. South Africa was saying there's an ir there's a risk of irreversible harm through the perpetration of genocide and mass killing, and the court needs to intervene to order Israel to um to stop its military uh, operations, basically as the only way to stop this genocide that is unfolding. The court was initially reluctant to order a full uh, ceasefire order, a full cessation of hostilities by against Israel, but did um issue a number of different provisional measures to say that it had to respect the genocide convention and make sure its army weren't committing acts of genocide and there what that there wasn't incitement to genocide going on in the public discourse in israel and so on that was the first set of orders and since then there have been two further sets of orders issued ordered by the court most recently an, an order by uh, the international court uh in, in late may uh, ordering israel to to halt its military offensive in in rafa specifically uh which as we know obviously israel hasn't done and responded to by only escalating and intensifying the bombings and the um uh killings in in rafa and so we have this you know um um contradiction essentially where you know south africa as the complaining state the international court of justice as the uh, judges are treating uh israel as a participant in this case who's engaged in 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 good faith when its lawyers are appearing in the court and um, participating in the in the process, at least in um, in in uh, ostensibly, but you know the decisions being made by the Israeli military and the Israeli state leaders on the ground are not in any way responding to what the international court of justice is ordering it to do and so we're back full circle to this problem that i started with at the start about you know lack of enforcement uh and about you know some of the question marks over the capacity of international law to develop to, to deliver on its promises and so the final point i will just uh mention is that you know that's that raises obviously a lot of crit criticisms about the insufficiency and incapacity of international law which are all genuine and legitimate and fair criticisms um, but what I would say is that, you know, international law itself is, is you know, is never really self-executing. There's no global, there's no UN police force as such to automatically enforce it. And it is ultimately dependent on, you know, the messy reality of international relations and relations between states to enforce it, but also is subject to and open to the possibilities and the capacity of social movements and um, other forms of, of activism in domestic courts and domestic political 
uh, systems and so on to try and use the tools that are provided by international law. And we have this order from the International Court of Justice saying it is there is a plausible uh, case that Israel is perpetrating genocide and Israel has to stop doing that. Uh, that then creates obligations on all other states not to be in any way complicit or aiding or abetting Israel's potential perpetration of genocide. That gives rise to our strong arguments for the need for an arms embargo or for trade sanctions or for other forms of diplomatic sanctions and uh, boycotts against Israel. And all of that is, you know, we've seen a huge amount of development in the last five months since the ICJ, ICJ case started from university decisions on cancelling re relations with Israeli universities, on decisions being made by uh, arms um, uh, or, or, or other companies to cancel contracts with Israeli manufacturers. We've seen um, also decisions or at least cases uh, being brought in domestic courts challenging challenging the um, uh, complicity of the American uh, administration of German political leaders, as well as uh, things like the export of of um, of military technologies and and part components for fighter jets and so on, being challenged in in different court systems. Some a lot of those cases are still going on. Some have had had initially positive decisions that did specifically reference the International Court of Justice's decision itself, and are now being appealed. For example, this one in the in the Netherlands, where the court did ban the export of, of fighter jet parts to Israel. The Dutch government is now appealing that and is and has in practice found workarounds where this is where instead instead of selling the fighter jet parts directly to Israel, it's just selling them to the US and then they're being sold on to Israel from there. There. So it's not, you know, these are not easy um, victories to 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 get to, but there are cases going on where they where they've been successful. The, the there might be a counter appeal against them where they've not been successful so far, as in, for example, the case against Biden in the US, the NGOs involved are are appealing those cases and trying to push further. And so there's various um initiatives going on the un um human rights experts have issued you know statements like this saying the need for an arms embargo on israel is heightened by the icj ruling in, in january and we have you know the um court order itself even if it's not being automatically complied with by israel or necessarily enforced by the by the un security council there are different ways that it has been quite uh, significant and effective in in influencing um uh uh, actions in some cases and decisions in some cases that are um push trying to push things further to to protect Palestinian rights on the ground. So I better stop there. I'm, I'm very sorry I went slightly over the time and I'm happy to uh to um respond to to the questions now and I'm happy to share the, the slides as well. I, I do appreciate it. it's um um uh, a, a lot I've tried to cover in, in uh, quite a short space of time there. So thanks very much for your attention and hopefully people are still with us and um i'll stop talking now okay john that was uh, uh absolute tour de force uh i learned so much <laughs> I, I, i'm just almost speechless with how, how much you packed in into in, into that 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 was absolutely brilliant uh i've never heard uh so much uh so much packed into an hour and so much relevant uh material that is like most of the people I'd say on the call, we've got up to about 125 people on the call, uh, which shows a massive amount of interest. Uh, one one comment was, can we have a separate session on the ICC and the ICJ judgment to get deeper understanding? And that just shows the, you know, the, 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 uh, the, 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 the kind of interest and the, and the, and the depth that, that of, of what you're, what you're uh, presenting here and the relevance of that. Uh, in general, a lot of comments coming in saying thank you for the great presentation. Uh, it was incredibly in informative. Uh, and a further on question: What impact does European do does European or do European countries recognizing Palestine now have, and is it relevant at all? Yeah, well, that's a good uh, question, and thank you for that. So, I mean, I suppose, like as I said, you know, in some ways, the time for European countries to recognize Palestine was in 1988 when that was when the when the, the PLO first asked for that and we can you know we can do you know it, it, there's obviously you know not um too much point in in doing the counterfactual uh history but things could have been you know if there was stronger support from influential Western countries and or even countries like Ireland at that time you know things could have um could have been different but because it was only only uh, quote unquote the 
um the global south countries that did recognize palestine at the time it didn't you know it, it meant that at you know in the uh in spaces of power where it could have um it could have made a difference it 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 uh it didn't at the time and so you know the question you know now uh, like what i think there is a serious question to ask of countries like ireland or spain or norway and, and other european countries have or are thinking about recognizing Palestine now I mean one question is why why now you know why not at any point over the last 35 years when they could have done so and obviously the art there was you know um um motions passed in in the Irish context in in the Dáil and the Shannad you know at least 10 years ago for off the top of my head to say that the government should do this and would do this and even then continued to stall and so there's you know I think there's um a, a legitimate critique that this is now, you know, the action that they're taking um, because they don't want to take other more concrete and, and material actions that they've been asked to do, like passing occupied territories, bail to ban settlement, uh, good uh, tr trade with settlements, uh, things like the, you know, the um, the divestment and arms embargo initiatives and legislation that have been proposed in various places, including in Ireland. And so, you know, in the, the thing with, with recognition uh, on a state level is that on in in the overall bigger picture of things it's you know it is largely a a symbolic act in the sense that the un 12 years ago has already established that israel or sorry that palestine exists and should exist and be recognized as an independent state and so if 130 138 states agreed at that point that that was the case that's you know that's the overwhelming majority and that's enough for palestine to have access to international uh, forums and institutions and to be counted as a legitimate international actor and so three more or four more or ten more states now isn't you know definitively changing much obviously the ripple effect can be important if a few european countries do it and then more and more and then all all 27 european union countries or some of the other western countries were to do so that you know does make it more difficult for Israel to say to 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 kind of assume that it will have automatic um it will have automatic support from its from its allies if it continues to try and annex territory in the West Bank or uh, you know would assume that it will automatically be protected at the Security Council by the US and Britain for example but you know in and of itself now in, you know in terms of like the um concrete difference that it makes from may to june of 2024 you know it's it's um it's symbolic more than more than anything uh rather than anything more significant than that but it, i suppose it is all part of the broader kind of um general trajectory towards a greater acceptance and legitimacy and recognition of, pa of the palestinian cause and of palestinian rights as a whole you know there is obviously a lot of palestinians will say you know this state is not uh, legitimate in our eyes that this is the PA kind of mini uh, Bantustan and we you know we don't see that as as legitimate but if we think about it you know in the international and I think you know that's obviously a fair um, uh, point of view that they've presented if we think about the international dynamics and if you think about you know support like something like the International Criminal Court and the possibility it will have to overcome the serious kind of political and financial obstacles that are going to be put in its way by the likes of the US or, or Germany, for example, um, the more support it has from, from as many countries as possible, including Western countries, to enable it to, to do its job will help. But, you know, it's it, I suppose it's, it's only one very small part of a much bigger uh, puzzle. Yeah. John, you refer there to the Security Council and some vetoes by uh, the US especially. Uh, so two related questions. Is there any way the General Assembly could bypass the uh, Security Council to authorize enfor enforcement actions by, by member states, if necessary, by military means? And uh, a related question, can the UN peacekeeping forces not intervene uh, in the situation and uh, or can the US also veto that? Yeah. Yeah, so again, very good questions. And it's, you know, there's not, it, there, there is a little bit of um nuance here. Like there is, a, generally, it is the Security Council that is responsible for and has the mandate for anything that comes under the the umbrella of, of international peace and security, which includes, um which includes the passing of resolutions for peace, keeping missions and peace enforcement missions, right? Which were the two kind of things that were, 
were mentioned there. So it is generally that is all under the Security Council's mandate, and therefore the you know the the US does have the capacity to to block that, and that has been the case. There is a resolution from 1950, which was a General Assembly resolution called the Uniting for Peace resolution, which does um, try to uh, allow, uh, accommodate this possibility that if the Security Council is paralyzed or is incapable of acting, that the General Assembly can assume some of its powers and can take on that mandate itself. That has been, you know, there have been various efforts to try and um initiate that it has been used a number of times but really you know since it was used you know the, the, the issue with it is that that was actually itself an american um creation to try and bypass the what it's a soviet obstruction on the on the security council at that time and to to try and a, a allow for un authorization of the essentially you know american-led in um intervention in, in korea in the context of the korean war in the early 1950s so it was used a number of times during the cold war period but it's kind of you know the the practic the pra in practical terms it hasn't really been um it, it, there's a there's an acceptance or an assumption that it can't be used in any kind of far-reaching way to overrule or bypass the security council post cold war there is like the the advisory opinion on the wall in 2004 that was requested by the general assembly and a number of other ongoing kind of processes where the un general assembly has has tried to do take certain actions in relation to palestine they all are actually already being done under the uniting for peace um mechanism so they have invoked that that 1950 resolution on uniting for peace and are saying we as a general assembly are uh, uh, in, um, initiating an international court of justice process or a fact-finding mission or other non-military um, uh, interventions and authorizations but it you know it, I, I my my like I think it, it's something that if there was um, you know a, a big a big enough coalition including some some major um, influential powers willing to take it on it's something that could be and should be kind of agitated for at the at the general assembly but there, it hasn't because it's been essentially that that process has been dormant for so long it hasn't um been taken up in in the way in in a way that would allow it would that would provide for un peacekeepers or um or a un a military intervention to impose a ceasefire for example but it is something that you know again some of the un uh, special experts and and um uh, special rapporteurs have been saying at least should be looked at because the situation now is so severe and the um lack of political will on the part of you know a major uh, superpower that's blocking things at the security council level you know has to be dealt with as an obstruction to peace and has to there has to be a way around that and so you know but again you know when for example ireland was on the security council for a couple of years 2021 22 this was something that had you know was that some of the palestinian human rights organizations have been asking for for a long time ireland had the opportunity to use its seat on the security council for example to try and speak to other security council members to initiate something that could direct things back to the general assembly from the security council uh, but didn't you know didn't choose to do so and so a lot of this we you know will be about you know just various diplomatic kind of maneuverings that are going on in the UN but you know obviously um uh, ethically and morally you know there's absolutely a strong argument that 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 all you know all of those avenues should be should be exercised but it, it, it requires a you know a strong coalition of states to take it up yeah john uh, specifically with regard to ireland obviously we've seen some bills passed in the shannon and the doll but still not implemented is there any legal uh any other uh, like so basically if in the the government basically said, yeah, we, we, we've we lost the vote or whatever, or, you know, the vote was in favour, but we're not implementing. Is there any legal, any other legal means or do, does politics trump the legal situation in this case? Yeah, I mean, you know, all the all that can be done in terms of the legal um, side of things is to keep putting forward the arguments like the, on, say, for example, specifically on the Occupied Territories Bill, the government's argument was that, this is something that's beyond the Irish government's competence because it's a question of trade and trade is a European Union uh, uh, competence. It's it's up to the European Commission and the European Union as a centralised 
uh, set of institutions to decide on any questions to do with trade. But you know, I know uh, there was you know, this is a question then of legal interpretation. There's many European Union lawyers that have said and have put you know have given legal opinions specifically about the Occupied Territories Bill in this in this scenario, saying there is space for member states to decide some of these questions on their own, and that the the EU law is not a block. To, uh, to Ireland passing the Occupied Territories Bill and the argument that the Irish Attorney General and the Irish government are relying on uh, is, um, is, is, is not sufficient to stop the legislation. The legislation could still go through. And in the worst case scenario, uh, you pass the legislation and there's a question mark over its legality under European Union law. That, gets re- that can then get referred to the European Court of Justice and they will be able to look at it and decide. But the Irish government itself shouldn't be deciding but in and by itself that we can't do this because of an EU law um obstacle when you know that that's certainly not there's not consensus on that and there is uh, a lot you know there is a, you know a, a lot of expertise that would say actually it's the it's the opposite way so you know but ultimately you know the reality is the um the the, the majority coalition uh numbers in government will mean that they you know they if if they uh, decide to uh, not to pass the legislation the you know the um the the opposition doesn't have the capacity to refer this or a civil society group doesn't have the capacity to refer this itself to the to the european court of justice and so it's you know it, it is ultimately you know it will come down to the to the political dynamics but i think you know increasingly you know for for a long time there was lots of stuff that the government was saying we can't do or we're not ready to do and now they are doing and we've seen that not just in ireland but in many other jurisdictions as well and so you know i think there's a certainly a strong uh, case to be made for con- continuing to put it back on the table continuing to push uh, the the arguments uh, politically among constituents uh, letting your letting rep, political reps know that you feel strongly about this and that this is some, something that uh, ireland should be doing yeah obviously uh, yeah ireland is very uh, uh, you know the government is very keen are very willing to, to use the excuse of Europe as a reason for not moving forward unilaterally. Um, obviously, Ireland is a neutral country, uh, or a so-called neutral neutral country, but there are now increasing uh, voices saying that we should be part of NATO, et cetera. Et cetera. How, do, how, do, how do you see that uh, in uh, both in itself and also in relation to, to Palestine? And, and, and from a legal perspective, is, is how, do you, how do you see that? Yeah, I mean that's a big, a big question. Obviously, just actually just before, just when you mentioned, because obviously, like you said, when Ireland, Ireland has a lot of the time relied on we can't do this by ourselves because we're part of the European Union, we have to decide things collectively, etc. But obviously, you know that whole argument that they've thrown that argument out the window themselves by going ahead with the recognition of the Palestinian state along with 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 Spain and Norway and a couple of you know a small minority of EU countries that have decided to do this by themselves and so clearly you know they they feel you know they're not bound to follow the European line or they don't need a consensus of all 27 countries uh, to do that and so that again you know um, means they've no leg to stand on when they're trying to make similar arguments for other for other measures that they that they're not willing to do so so that's one part of it i mean i think the question about um, neutrality, NATO, you know, a lot of this also does tie into Europe and the European Union's own militarization and its increasing kind of focus on diverting resources to military spending and all of the, you know, what it, what it presents under the, the overall defense umbrella, but being, you know, a, a very, a very clear kind of agenda that's coming from uh, a lot of the establishment forces in, in um, Brussels and in, in some of the main member states towards you know and some of this is tied to the militarization of the borders and the um the european uh, um um exclusion of uh, of 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 um people people trying to come to europe on various migration routes uh, some a lot of it is tied to to the situation in ukraine and this kind of position that the european union has developed where it doesn't want to actively be a participant in the in the war in ukraine but it is you know very much um uh, invested in you know the the arms industry um support for for um transfers to to ukraine and so you know the um wh- where this you know how this plays out in relation to 
to Palestine is obviously, you know, again, you know, it's it's not it's it's not a good trajectory that we're on. It's not a good horizon if we're talking about, you know, whatever about Ireland's position and whether Ireland holds uh, uh, clearly and strongly to the to the position on neutrality or whether, you know, there is this push towards um to to towards alignment closer alignment or or thinking about joining nato like the the general kind of trajectory of um increasing western militarization expansion of the arms production sector in europe and all of that you know a lot of so much of that is tied to relations with the israeli security and military uh, sector the arms um industry there so much of you know the um uh, flow of of technologies and of information as well as of weapons between Israel and Europe for example you know there, there's a, a kind of a, a two-way relationship that's that's very clearly developed there the Israeli sector is using the whole um idea that its weapons and its technologies are are battle tested and proven because they've been used in Gaza and so on that's a selling point for them that they're able to you know um benefit from them from in their in the export of their weapons and technologies to to the rest of the world but also you know obviously for european arms production and we see it in you know the types of cases that have been coming up dutch um dutch uh components of for 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 35s the level and the scale of the german exports arms exports to to israel and how the the you know the, the kind of uh huge um increase in that in the last year you know there, there's a, a lot of um a lot of uh money to be made by by selling arms to, to countries like israel and so you know all of that is is, is going in a very you know militarized di direction which is not going to be obviously in the in the interests of of protecting palestinian rights and so i think that's you know again i think some of the discussions or debates that will be coming up or are coming up and will be coming up in the irish context uh there, there's clearly i think important connections to be made between to, and, and uh as part of the general you know the importance of pushing back against militarization removing some of the checks and balances on, on irish neutrality and so on uh th that do tie in obviously to um to having a better and more principled position on on palestine and that will you know that that can that, that you know relates obviously to stuff like the the u.s military's use of shannon airport it relates to things like the the arms embargo bill that the the shannon um group put forward recently um and, and the need to support initiatives like that to uh, to make sure that Irish um, funds aren't going are being used by by as part of the European Union budget to support arms manufacture for arm for arms uh, companies that are selling directly to Israel, as well as to make sure that you know there's no question of Irish uh, airspace or Irish uh, territorial waters being used to facilitate arms transfers to um, to to Israel. Yeah. Two related questions, um, and uh, I'm conscious of time now. We're, we're coming to the, I guess, to, to close. To be fair to you, uh, have any other initiatives been taken in any other countries similar to the Occupied Territories Bill, of, or the Occupied Territories Bill, uh, as as I understand it, is specific to Ireland? But have any other similar initiatives taken been taken in other countries, European countries, especially uh, other European countries? Uh, especially European or yeah. maybe... I mean I think you know again you know there I I think um the likes the likes of, I I don't know that I don't have all the details now so I won't I won't speak with any authority on it but I know for example in places like Norway which again you know there's there's obviously a, an alignment there and Norway and Ireland did the, the recognition of the Palestinian state mm -hmm. together uh, there there is there was there was a similar initiative brought forward in Norway. I'm not sure how far that's got through the legislative process there. I know in other countries like you know even in Latin America, the likes of Chile, uh, were were essentially adopting a similar position uh, and template to the legislation that had been proposed by Francis Black's groups group in Ireland to to um uh, enact similar. Yeah. Uh, Any that. anything at the General Assembly level, UN General, General Assembly level. Similar to that, I mean, what no, like what the, the at the at the UN level there is the the UN blacklist which does um name and uh recommend against any um support for or trade with this list of a hundred plus companies that have been uh, um demonstrated to have been actively involved in 
settlement, uh, the, the Israeli settlement enterprise in the West Bank. And so a lot of um, Israeli and international companies that are on the UN blacklist itself. But in terms of in terms of the overall, you know, uh, idea of prohibiting trade with um with uh, the Israeli settlements, I mean, there, there, there's a clear, there's a norm there that the settlements are illegal. There's a, a, a norm then that any illegal, um, ac- any illegal situation should not be recognized or aided or assisted by the UN member states. And so there is a general kind of duty under international law for all states that are part of the UN not to engage with uh, or uh, engage in any activity that would be see- that would be supporting uh, the settlement infrastructure and enterprise and so in you know in principle you know the 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 spirit of the of the um occupied territories bill exists as a principle of international law that all states should be following and you know so the, the what i the way i would understand it is that the uh, occupied territories bill is essentially the irish domestic the attempt to, to provide an irish domestic enforcement of an international law obligation that ireland has not to um aid or assist or legitimize the illegal situation situation of the settlements the same would apply for for apartheid if there's an apartheid regime in place all member states have a duty not to recognize or aid or assist that um regime and then when it comes to genocide and this is where the genocide case the icj is important uh in 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 relation to genocide the duty is not just not to aid or assist the in the commission of genocide but also a duty to prevent uh, the commission of genocide, uh, so a, a, a kind of a pre a, a proactive and a pre um, a preemptive kind of duty, not just a, a reactive one to respond to the illegality after it's happened or after it's been established. And so there again, you know, uh, Israel has been accused of genocide. The International Court has said there's a plausible case it is perpetrating genocide. So all states have a duty to do everything within their capacity and under the under what you know what makes sense in terms of their existing relations with Israel they have a duty not to um or a duty to to act to try and prevent the genocide and that would include you know things like uh, arms sales obviously but also other forms of, of diplomatic pressure or or sanctions that could be that could be imposed uh obviously Ireland at one stage uh, that well the government uh, said they were looking at seriously supporting the South African case right but they seem to have done nothing on that in the last six months, right? Or in the last, I'm sorry, less than six months for when it was brought up, I guess, in January. Uh, is there, is that, do you see Ireland uh, changing their view on that? And is it important that they support it? And also just a, how many countries actually support it? It's not just South Africa. It's a whole other uh, uh, list of countries as well supported the South Africa case. Yeah, so thanks for that question. I'll just pull my slide back up on that if you can hopefully see that there. Mm-hmm. Uh, so basically, yeah, the way it works, so South Africa has brought this case against Israel. They're saying, you know, Israel is violating the Genocide Convention in its actions in Gaza. We, as South Africa, as a member of the Genocide Convention, have this obligation and this duty to prevent genocide, right? So that, that obligation that I just mentioned there, which uh, about preventing genocide which does include not you know and get not engaging in certain relations and so on it also said africa's argument is that we're we have this duty under the convention and one of the ways we can implement it is to bring this case forward at the at the international court right so they've and that there was a lot of discussion after you know the scale and severity of the israeli war became so apparent all of the statements of genocidal intent were so apparent from very early on in october there was a lot of discussion through october november Genes- this was a possible genocide the genocide convention was relevant someone should take a case uh to te- to, to to try and um Im- Im- implement it and force a compliance under the international court of justice uh rules which uh, give the international court jurisdiction over the uh implementation and enforcement of the genocide convention so south africa ultimately were the ones to br- bring that forward for various kind of important reasons that i mentioned about their particular role and history and since then, there is a process where they are the ones taking the case against Israel, but other states who who have either a direct, you know, who feel that the case may directly um, have a legal implication for themselves, they can uh, what's called intervene, so file a, file an intervention in the case, a submission in the case, either if either if they think that they will be directly affected by the outcome of the case, or because they feel they have a legal contribution to make to the case that will help the judges better best decided right that they have a um 
a particular understanding of the genocide convention in this case that uh, their legal argument will help the, the court to decide and so so far um sort of so far five other um states apart from south africa have already filed interventions right and so they're listed there nicaragua colombia libya mexico and most recently palestine itself have all filed their interventions in the case palestine obviously says is, is under article 62 there which says which because they they will be directly legally affected by it obviously and then the others um certainly Colombia, Libya and Mexico all under Article 63 as well. And I think Nicaragua, because they also have their own case going on against Germany, which is a separate <clears throat> issue, but accusing Germany of complicity in the genocide, Nicaragua have intervened as well. So they, they're the ones that have done it so far. And a number of others there that have listed at the bottom. Germany was very quick at the start when South Africa first filed the case to say, this is not a this is not this is a, a mill a, a willful misuse of international law by South Africa or you know this is not um a fair uh, way to use the genocide convention it's it's um ridiculous to be accusing Israel of genocide and so on so we're going to intervene and make our legal legal argument on that basis they said that at the start but they've gone uh, you know there hasn't been much uh, I haven't heard much since then, since the court has clearly taken the case much more seriously than Germany did initially and has issued a series of orders. Um, it's not clear if Germany will follow through on that plan to intervene. And then all of the others have also that are listed there, including mm -hmm. Ireland, have all said that they're that they're they will intervene as well. The intervention is not it's not like we're intervening on one side or another. We're with South Africa or we're with Israel, even though Germany made clear very clear that they you know, we're, their intervention would be with Israel if it does come. And many of the other countries have made clear that they support South Africa's case. But again, the idea is that it's meant to be a, le a specific legal argument or legal contribution to the case, not just we're with South Africa, we want them to win the case. So what, what the Irish government said, ultimately, you know, initially, you know, and it was interesting to see, and I'm sure many of you followed this and were, were kind of calling on, uh, involved in calling on, on the Irish government to do so. At first, Leo Varadkar was saying, you know, this is this doesn't, you know, where this doesn't seem to be uh the right, you know, process and we're not sure about genocide and all the rest. So they went, you know, from in, in January from being very dubious or very almost critical of the case to by February, March coming around to the position that actually, yes, there is a case to answer here and we should we should have a role in intervening. And again, you know, there'd be a critical view that th this is something that they can do that's something to be seen to be doing something to contribute to um and to respond to some of the, the um uh demands of the of the solidarity movement and the opposition and so on to take a stronger position this is something that ireland can do that won't cost it anything it won't cost anything in terms of um uh trade relations and so on but you know it, it is it could be it could uh, also be you know a significant contribution depending on depending on what the intervention is right and so there it comes to then what it, you know how do these interventions work what's the point of them what and, and what's the best way to go about it and so there is you know as as much as i you know we can be critical of the irish government legitimately for stalling for not for saying it wasn't going to do this then saying it is going to do it and but now it hasn't done anything the phase that we're in now of the the uh, of the case is that South Africa has asked for these provisional measures. The court has ordered some provisional measures. The next phase then will be um, uh, what what what's called the the full memorials being submitted by first by South Africa and then by Israel. And so that's what South Africa has presented so far is only its kind of preliminary case. Essentially, it has now a deadline of October set by the court to file its full. Uh, it's called a memorial, but basically the full uh, version of its complaint and its arguments. In October, we they will submit that to the court, and then Israel has until uh, I think it's uh sometime next, like maybe sometime between May, June, July. I can't remember exactly, but may, let's say May of twenty twenty five. So they have a number of months to respond to it, and in that phase, that's normally when the interventions uh happen in because that that the the other countries will have a have had a chance to look at what South Africa is actually arguing in de in much more detail than what we've seen so far. And then to be able to make their contribution uh, based on that. There's nothing to say that they have to wait until then. And obviously five other countries have already gone ahead and filed their interventions already. 
the as I understood it at the time that Neil Martin made the announcement, they said they were going to wait, they were going to study what South Africa wrote in its full memorial and then make their intervention based on that. And they want to have their deliberations and make sure that they're making a meaningful contribution to the case. And so, you know, if that is the case and if that's true, you know, that is fair enough in one sense. They're, they could make a lot more of a powerful contribution and a significant contribution by by waiting and seeing what South Africa um argues in its full memorial and then trying to add to that you know again the cynical um other side of it could say well they're you know maybe they're just stalling and they're waiting they know that there could be an election in the meantime they may not be the government anymore mm -hmm. uh things you know already there's question marks you know with the set after the South african elections what what form the government is going to take there and will they be as fu as fully invested will the new government be as fully invested as the outgoing government was and you know could that also lead to, to some delays in the case and so there's a lot of you know political dynamics going on beneath the surface let's say but you know in theory the, the role of ireland or any other country intervening in this case would be to present something useful to the court that could help it to um, adjudicate the case and make a better decision. And so one of the things I've been saying was like, okay, what, what can Ireland contribute? What's particular about Ireland's um, uh, place in, in responding to this case? And one of the things that's been quite significant in how South Africa is trying to present the case is obviously there's all of the question of the bombardments, the killings, the airstrikes as a form of genocide, as a form of mass killing and, and um, um, attempt to destroy the Palestinians in Gaza as a group. But there's also then this part about the starvation and the enforced, you know, essentially state on the state on people in there's this is where we narrow or historically it has been quite narrow and so there's an argument you know maybe you know the type of genocide we're seeing here should also be you know there should be space also for starvation and famine imposed famine to be considered as an act of of genocide that's something that ireland has a very particular uh history uh when we think about the famine and the the way you know even some of the our own historical debates and rethinking or or you know narrating of the of the famine was it a famine uh, that just happened to happen because there was a, 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 a an issue with a particular crop or was it a form of genocide that was imposed by a colonial regime and obviously the genocide convention didn't exist in the 1840s but there has been some interesting kind of legal analysis done and kind of you know hypothetical um uh of the text under the laws of genocide and whether it would qualify as such and so that's you know i think something that the that Ireland could make a particular contribution on in in an in an intervention, you know, and they could do that now. There's nothing to stop them doing that now. But that you know, I, I as I understand it, they're still planning to do something in terms of an intervention. But they're saying that they're going to wait until they know more details about what the South African case is. And just to mention very final point on this, and sorry I'm going on uh, a little bit on this, but I think it was it's also important to say like the. You there is a, a case going on in the International Court of Justice between Ukraine and Russia, and in that case, the European countries decided to intervene en masse. I think 32 or 33 of the Western and European countries all submitted interventions, all more or less around the same time and on the same issue to do with you know a particular kind of technical argument about the accusations uh, that were being made against Russia in that case. But in the interim decision, that case is not finished yet, but in one of the interim decisions, the court essentially um, threw out those interventions and all the arguments that had been made and, and rejected them. And so there's a, it's also just, I suppose, a little bit of a, a reality check in that just because you have good intentions and lots of countries intervening, say, making an argument in a case, it doesn't mean that that will automatically be accepted by the by the court. And, and, and it was a little bit of a, I suppose, a uh reality check in that you know interventions in and of themselves you know might can be might be sometimes limited in their impact and actually you know it the argument that south africa is building the case that it's been presenting uh is you know is, is much you know is much more definitive in in the in the long term but you know there there can be a space for other countries to to make a contribution but they do need to you know, i suppose present it in in a way that will be um 
uh, strong enough to be to be accepted by the court in the Ukraine case. It was very clearly kind of a a political decision by the European by the Western countries to say we want to support Ukraine and so we're going to file these interventions and support them. But it wasn't. It probably wasn't very um, deeply thought through, and it was thrown out then on the judge by the judges on that basis. John, a final question. It's kind of a, a, a kind of a big question in terms of like, uh, are you optimistic? Uh, it, like, I, I think it's very hard to be optimistic in the short term when you see what's happening in Gaza, when, when you see it's happening in Palestine, and when you see how international law has been treated internationally, politically, etc. Et um, but in the longer term, like like in the trajectory that you mentioned about four or five hundred years of 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 international law basically being stacked in favor of the of the powerful countries against the weaker countries, and we can still see that happening. But the what you mentioned there about in nineteen sixty that the global south became you know the majority in the general assembly and therefore was able to pass resolutions on their behalf, etc. Et in the big pictures kind of scenario do you, are you optimistic in terms of both the the the, the role uh, that which of which international law can play and is playing uh, linked with the bds movement li linked with the the global solidarity being shown and i think they i think it seems to me as a layperson that a, a lot of these things are pulling in the same direction and pull it, pulling in a positive direction not not so much immediately but in the longer term yeah, so now that's you know that's a it's a great question. It's very obviously very hard to say you know to to say you're optimistic when when we're you know in the in the moment we're in where we're talking about now you know we've been watching you know a, a live stream genocide for the last two hundred and sixty days or whatever it is, and every day seems to be in some ways worse than than the last. But I would be up so I I so I was, I'm, I'm optimistic uh, in. Uh, not necessarily in international law. I don't have a like I said at the start. I don't have uh, you know any major faith in international law uh, as as a you know as a, a structure in and of itself. Um, I don't. I think if it's left to its own devices, it's not going to you know it's not going to liberate anybody by itself. But I do you know I do I am optimistic in the capacity and the power of of people and movements to harness the tools limited as they are or be set by double standards and hypocrisy as they are but to continue to harness them and to continue to agitate and organize for uh for justice for 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 palestinians you know and we you know if you see you you know i suppose one big part of it is just how um uh, steadfast and committed palestinians themselves are in the face of everything and that gives us all hope and strength and support that we have to keep doing whatever little bit we can to to work um in support of of that and so i and I, I just came back to this slide because i know there was some um questions about recommendations for um for resources and materials and so on and many of you probably will know um Nora Erekat and her her book on which is on justice for some law and the question of of Palestine. But for those that don't, I mean, it's a, it's it's a quite a good um first of all introduction to a lot of the stuff that I've been talking about, but obviously getting deeper into the the technicalities, the histories, the sources. It start it starts also from ba the Balfour Declaration and the and the League of Man League of Nations mandate, but comes right up until around twenty. 2019, 2020, I think it was published. But what Nora talks about a lot is, you know, the role of law being in service of social movements and political movements that the the it's it, you know it's all about how we as you know in our different communities and in our different sectors whether that's in universities whether that's in trade unions whether that's in um as political represent representatives and councils or parliaments whether it's us as individual consumers doing what small uh, bits and pieces we can um you know it it's it's the ultimately and if we think about you know successful movements for liberation and emancipation you know it will all always ultimately come back to you know the, the diversity of tactics the combination of different fronts working together and i think you know as grim and depressing and horrendous that it is that it's taken you know a, 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 an unfolding genocide in gaza for things to um uh, fast forward as much as they have in the last few months but the reality is you know they had there has been huge uh and significant developments in some sectors which you know what which won't you know won't be easy uh to to to, re to reverse and you know, if you read the like the statements say for example from 
Pack B and the Palestinian Campaign for the Academic and Cultural Boycott, talking about how you know they've been organizing and working on these issues for the last twenty years, and they've had they've never seen as many um, uh, successes and victories and steps forward in twenty years as they have in the last three or four months, and the, the you know the, the the pace and the momentum that is that is there now, at least in certain uh, sectors where things are. Um, you know, there there has been a, a realization, and institutions are starting to realize that you know they 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 can't stand on the wrong side of history, and they do need to do what they can to um to intervene. Obviously, there's huge uh political obstacles there at every step of the way, and particularly if we think about you know at the highest levels and in the UN system and with the US government and so on. But um, you know, I I if we you know come back to your question about the the more kind of medium term or generational kind of horizon um you know i think um we you know we what we've seen the the um uh, refusal of the palestinians to give up on their own cause and the new generations now of young people around the world who are you know uh, taking up the the mantle and uh, committing to their activism and support for palestinian liberation and, and solidarity in a way that's going beyond you know that in the last number of months has gone beyond anything that we've seen in um you know in many years i think that you know has to be only um grounds for for optimism despite you know like i said how bleak the situation is right now okay john that's 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 a great note to to end on uh and when i say end i mean this particular session and uh we obviously have another session next next week and we would encourage everyone to come along to that because we want to kind of look back at uh at the, at the at the at the sessions uh, at the different perspectives and also ask the question how can we be most effective in supporting palestine palestine and palestinians um, so thank you, John. That that was absolutely amazing. I don't think I've ever learned so much in 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 a. You've gone over well over the hour, but um, and as you said, you went on a little bit. But you, I'm I'm so glad you went on because uh, uh, it was it, that was absolutely amazing. And all the comments are coming in, uh, loads of comments coming in saying that as well. So uh, that's great. Thank you for the to the participants who stayed, uh, who came and who stayed, and the vast majority of people are still on the line. So that's that's amazing. Uh, we, this session is recorded, so I'm certainly going to be looking back on it because uh, uh, there's loads of things that that I that I, I I partly picked up, but I think I need to go back and look at them again. We will be putting together a pack together at the end of this five sessions, uh, and we will have this recording. We will have some resources from John, and I'll be following. We'll be following up on that just to make sure we 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 have those, and we will make those available at the end of the session. As I say, we have a session next week and we're, we hope we'll have you back. So thanks again, John, and thank you for everyone. Uh, and we'll close it there. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, everyone. Great. Thank you. And thank you, Donald and Brian, as well.